Well, good morning. Oh, we can do better than that. Come on, good morning. All right. It's great to, great to be here. Great to be here with you. And uh, very excited uh, about um, what your church is going through and what your church is uh, doing in these, these days. And uh, very ex- been spending some time with Pastor and Jason and just very excited about what God's doing here in uh, your church. About a year ago, uh, a little more than a year ago, we had an event here at your church. And, uh, and I know many of you volunteered, and I just wanted to say thank you for, for hosting that. We have about 100, you know, we have 190 churches now in, a, in a, uh, about a five to six state range, and they all came and gathered here. And your church did a wonderful job hosting us. And, uh, and so I just want to just publicly say thank you. I know some of you volunteered. Yes, give everybody a hand. Um, thank your staff. Thank the volunteers. Uh, it was just a wonderful event and very powerful. One of the biggest ones we ever had. So uh, we're just very thankful. Uh, Converge Mid America is a is a group of churches, uh, and I like to describe us this way: we're a missional network of gospel-driven churches. We're a missional network of gospel-driven churches. And so we're, we're around we about 190 churches uh, in our region. We've actually grown from 86 churches in the last, uh, the last 10 to 12 years to 190 churches. We've gone from about 15,000 people in our constituency to over 50,000 people in our constituency. And we're planting about seven, eight churches a year and getting about five or six churches who are just saying, you know what, we're tired of doing it alone. We want to be a part of something bigger than us. And, uh, and so our, our partnership together uh, is really making a difference uh, in, in, in the world and in this region um, as we work together to see new churches started, to see older churches encouraged uh, to live out their missional dream in their community. Because it all comes down to seeing lives change, doesn't it? It all comes down to seeing lives change with the power of the gospel. And so we're very excited about our partnership with you and, uh, and your, giving, your giving this morning as you worship God and your giving, that impacts not only this church, but also a region of churches. And so we're very grateful, very grateful. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to open it to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, Paul's letter to this church in the, city, the great city of Ephesus. And uh, the passage that we're going to look at today is actually a prayer that Paul prayed for the churches. And this is a prayer that that I pray for the churches, the 190 some churches. Uh, We're hoping to be over 200 churches here in the next uh, six months. But uh, that I pray for our churches. Uh, Paul actually has two prayers in the book of Ephesians. Uh, The first prayer is really a prayer of enlightenment. A prayer of enlightenment. And the second prayer in chapter 3 is a prayer of strengthening, strengthening. And so let me read this passage and then we'll pray and we're going to dig into God's word today, all right? Starting at verse 15. For this reason, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, we come as your children, and we humble ourselves before your word. And I come as your servant, humbling myself before your, humbling myself before your word. And Father, we want to hear your voice today. We want to hear your thoughts. 
For those who need a word of encouragement, Father, bring that word of encouragement. For those who need a word of challenge, bring that word of challenge. And so we come, I come, wanting to hear your words, hearing your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I came to Christ over 30 some years ago, and God just plucked me out of a, out of a, out of a, a life of um, just a totally, you know, moving in the wrong direction, okay? I was not moving towards God. I was moving away from God as fast as I could. And, and it was so interesting that God intercepted my life and grabbed me and, uh, and put a new song in my heart and gave me a new direction and purpose. If, I, if you were to tell me I'm doing what I'm doing today, uh, I would have looked at you and I would have said, you know, you need a check up from the neck up. That's what I would have said. Because there was no way I could imagine that I'd be doing what I am today. I thought I'd be working for my, help it running my father's business and, uh, and making lots of money and going in, going in a different direction. But God plucked me out as, as I was 19 years old. Uh, I was invited to go to a Billy Graham crusade. And, uh, and I got there in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I got to that Billy Graham crusade and that, that's a whole story in itself how I got there. Uh, but God, I sat there and all of a sudden it was like, it was like his arms reached out and grabbed me by the collar and said, young man, I got something important to say to you today. And I sat there for the 20, 30 minutes that he was speaking with my mouth open, just staring. And my girlfriend at the time, now she's my wife, she, she leaned over and said, Gary, what's wrong? I said, I don't know, this guy's talking about me. And she said, well, maybe that's God talking to you. What? God talking to me in Milwaukee County Stadium? I can't believe this. And uh, she asked me if I wanted to go forward. And I said, no, I'm not ready for that. And, and, uh, and I didn't know that she actually wanted to go forward. <laughs> uh, when they had all the people go forward. And I know I'm not ready for that. But then uh, this usher came by us and walked real close to us, and he had the white chicken bucket, you know, that took the offering in. And, uh, you know, my, part of my religious upbringing was, you know, I'll just try to buy some time from God. So I pulled out my wallet, and I dumped in all my money and said, you know, I'll buy a little time from God, and I'll go to church every Sunday. Well, that began a journey for me. You know, God came, God came into my life, and there's things that God did God did over the, next, over the next 10 months in my life that, that were things that only God could do. Because a few months later, I finally submitted and surrendered my life to Christ. After a wild night of hanging out with my buddies, coming home about two in the morning, we stopped at a, stopped at a, uh, a park in Delfield, Wisconsin, a little town Delfield, Wisconsin, stopped in this park, and basically I said, you know what? See all this stuff, this stuff controls my life and I'm, I'm, I'm living for it and, 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 and it's possessing me. And I said, I'm gonna throw this all away and we took all this stuff I had in my apartment, all this junk, all this stuff that reminded me of this life I was living. And we took it, we threw it all away, put, threw it in this dumpster and I said, I'm gonna give my life to Jesus. And my buddy's looking at me, can't believe him, can't, can't, just can't fathom that I'm doing this. And he says, I don't understand this, but this moment was so powerful that he started pulling stuff out of his pockets. And he threw it in a dumpster. And he said, I'm going to join you. And we both got on our knees that night at about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and said, you know, we don't understand this, but we're just going to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. Well, the interesting thing is he's a missionary now in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> See, there, there are certain things that only God can do in a person's heart. See, only God can give you a love for Jesus. Only God can give you a love for his word. I went from being in bars five nights a week to, to going to Bible studies five nights a week. I went from sleeping in on Sunday morning to going to church three hours on Sunday morning. And those are, only, those are things that only God can do in the human heart. 
give you a love for his word. And, and one, one of the other interesting things was, is God gave me a love for God's people. You know, I didn't want to hang around Christians. I mean, you know, no disrespect or anything, but I, I didn't, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't the world I hung around. But when I came to Christ, when Christ opened my heart to the, to the wonders of, of his truth and to his gospel and, and, and to his message, all of a sudden I had this affinity with people. I would, I would meet people who were Christians and it was like there was this brotherhood, this supernatural brotherhood that I was a part of. And I was drawn to them. You know, one day I, I was at a workplace and they called this guy the preacher. You know, they said, he's the preacher. And I, and I went up to him one day and I, and I said, are you really a pastor or preacher or something? And he said, he said, no, but I was a missionary for a number of years. And I said, well, I just got saved and I don't know anything about the Bible. I need someone to teach me the Bible. He was 20 years older than me. And every day for the next two and a half years, we got together at lunchtime and studied the Bible together. And he mentored me in the faith. I would have never done that on my own. You see, there are certain things that only God can do in the human heart. There are certain hungers and desires that only God, that, that shows evidence that God's spirit is at work in our lives. We know over the years, as I've matured in my faith and as I've walked this, walked this spiritual journey, now more, I've lived more years in the light than in the darkness. You know, my, 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 I've come to church in, in many different ways. And, I, and, and sometimes I'll come to church with a, with a torch in my hand, just ready to light up everybody else's faith and just encourage everybody. But there have been seasons in my life where I've come to church with a bucket in my hand. And so there's two types of people. There's, there are what I call torch bearers and bucket carriers, right? Let me, let me just walk through this with you. You've got some, uh, you can fill these in, you got some notes so you can fill in if you want. But uh, I, I got a few things here. You know, a, t a torchbearer is a person who comes into a situation and they focus on what's right. They come in in faith and they're going, I'm entering into this arena through faith and, and, and I'm believing that, that God is going to do something great here. They're the people who focus on what's right. A, a, a bucket carrier is the person who walks into a situation and they focus on what's wrong, right? They focus on what's wrong. They come in and they just do their, their bucket of pessimism and doubt and discouragement. They just focus on, oh, this is wrong, that's wrong, what's wrong with this, you know? And they see everything is wrong. But a torchbearer is the person who focuses on what's right. A bucket carrier is one who, who basically has a, what I call a questioning spirit. They possess a questioning spirit. Uh, they, they ask questions for the purpose of producing doubt. But a torchbearer asks questions that produce faith. That produce faith, that, that, produce faith that, that help us move beyond ourselves and to see how God is working and, and how we can join him in that work. Bucket carriers are always working to produce dissension. Through their doubt, through their doubtful questions, through their wrong focus, they're bringing, they're bringing dissension into the ranks. But a torchbearer is one who produce, that works to promote, promote unity, promote unity. You know, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul really strongly says, you know, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle and patient, bearing with one another in love. And then he says, make every, every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Torchbearers work to promote unity. Bucket carriers quench the work of the Holy Spirit. With their bucket, they quench the work of the Holy Spirit. They interfere with the work of the Spirit that's going on. Maybe in a small group or in a church or on a leadership team. But torchbearers, what do they do? They fuel the work of the Spirit. They fuel the work of the Spirit. They bring their light in with other people's light and they light people up and they light up the light up the wherever they're at. 
Now, I don't know where you're at today. I don't know how you came to church today, whether you came to dirt church today with your tor- torch trimmed and lit and, and, and uh, flaming, or you came to work, came to, came to church today with a bucket in your hand. But I think God has something to say to us today. And in this prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed, who I believe is the greatest torchbearer that ever lived, the Apostle Paul who was the greatest torchbearer that ever lived, he, he went into areas where there, were, where, where there was just spiritual darkness, and he brought the light of God's love into those areas, and he planted lighthouses of God's love all over Europe and Asia, Asia Minor. In this prayer, I think he's saying to these Ephesian Christians, he's saying, you need to be a church of torchbearers. And so there's three things, three things we'll work through real quickly. Three handles I think we can grab onto in this prayer to to help us become the torchbearers that God wants us to be. The first one is found in verse 16. It's by cultivating a grateful heart by cultivating a grateful heart. He says, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you always in my prayers. You know, I'm just amazed. I'm amazed at how many times in my life something good happens to me and I can, be, I can, be, I can become so ungrateful just within, within 24 hours. You know, there's that, there's that just temptation to be, to, to, that, you know, there, there's the ingrate in all of us, right? <laughs> And how something really good can happen to us, and then, uh, then within 24 hours later, we're just unthankful. We got to work at being thankful. We need to cultivate it in our hearts and lives. And we see this, we see this where Paul says, For this reason, verse 15, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Three, three little words that help me cultivate a thankful heart. And there are these words, expect, look, and tell. Expect God to work in others. Expect God to be at work in others. Look for God working in others. And what? Tell others how God is at work in them. The first, the first principle is the faith principle. It's when I'm walking and living by faith, I walk into situations and I'm, I'm, I'm expecting God to be at work. I got up this morning, drove down here, had a great drive, with just with, with building up, just encouraged to see God at work here this morning. It's expecting God to be at work. Number two, look for God and work at others. Look, if, if you're going to look for how God's at work in others, you need to understand the things that only God can do. Only God can help people love Jesus. Only God can help people crave the word of God. So if you're in your workplace and what? Somebody's having a conversation about the Bible, you need to join in that because that's, all, that's something that only God can do, right? Only God can, can cause people to serve sacrificially. Only God can give people a love for God's people. And so we need to look at how God's work. And then the last thing is we need to tell others how God's at work in them. That's the principle of reinforcement reinforcing, reinforcing people's hearts, reinforcing how God is at work in other people. It's what Paul says here. Paul says, look, look, I've, I've, I've heard about your faith. I've heard about your love for all the saints and I've not stopped giving thanks for you. He just encourages them. He reinforces what God is doing in their hearts. I don't know about you, how many of you like getting these uh, thank you notes? You know, little, little, little white card thank you notes? Only three of you? Come on, we all like getting these. I, I don't know what it is about these little silly thank you notes, right? But we, we get these little thank you notes that says thank you on it, and then someone writes some chicken scratch inside of it, right? And they say, thank you for what you've done in, in my life or in my heart or how you serve me or how you've blessed me. But you know what? I read that. Every time I read one of those, it just what fills me up right? It fills me up. I've got a whole file of these things that, that I've gotten over the years, and I've got a whole another file of critical letters, you know, but that one's a little smaller because I throw most of those away. But I mean, we like getting these thank you notes because what it, it builds us up. It encourages us. 
It reminds us we're loved and needed and wanted. And there's always times in our lives where we, we just need that. We need that boost. We need to feel loved and needed and wanted. You know, one of the marks of a healthy church is that it has a, it has a spirit of affirmation about it. And so I want to ask you, when's the last time you wrote a thank you note to someone in your church? When's the last time you wrote a, wrote a, wrote a thank you note to someone who leads your small group? Or when's the last time you wrote a, a thank you note to those teaching your children? When's the last time you wrote a thank you note to, to the staff, to the, to the worship team, to the technical crew? When's the last time you, you wrote a thank you note to your pastor? Because those things, what? They reinforce what God is doing in and through them. When's the last time you wrote a thank you note to, to the, st- the staff wives, the pastor's wives? You know, I can't tell you the times my wife got a thank you note from some, one of our elders. I mean, she still, she still has these. This is 20 years ago. See, healthy churches have a spirit of affirmation because they're cultivating a thankful heart. The second thing about becoming a torchbearer is in verse 17. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. You see, the second point here is is if we're going to have a spirit of affirmation, it's through praying to know God better. Do you pray that prayer? Do you pray a prayer, prayer like that for yourselves? Lord, I want to know you better. I want to know you better. Paul is, Paul is sitting there, I'm praying for you as a church to know God better. And what does it mean? What does it mean to know God better? You know, there's a lots of different theories out there, lots of different ideas about what it means to know God better. And I'm going to give you a definition here in a few minutes. But first I want to just talk about a, a couple of things. Number one, it's more than just factual knowledge. Knowing God better is more than just factual knowledge. When I was a new Christian, I thought, man, the way I get to know God better, just pummel some Bible in my brain, right? I just need to get more Bible in my brain, and then I'll know God better. And you know, there's some truth to that. When we pour 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 our lives over God's word, and we get to hear God's thoughts and God's ideas, Because we've lived our lives, what, with our own ideas and our culture's ideas. And we need to get, know God's thoughts and God's ideas on things. But, you know, it's more than that. It's more than just, because, you know, there's a lot of people out there that think they're really deep. They're really deep theologically, but you know what? They're probably, they're really muddy practically. They just can't get moving forward. They might know all the truth, but they're not accomplishing anything with it. And then the second thing is that it's more than just zealous energy. It's more than just zealous energy. I used to think, I just need to get more passionate about prayer and I'll get to know God better. I just need to get more passionate about evangelism and then I'll get to know God better. It's more than that. Because you know, there's a lot of passionate people out there who are really shallow, see? And then it's more than just a warm, fuzzy feeling. You know, sometimes we just get this, this warm feeling. You know, I came to Christ out of the drug culture of the 70s, and my friends and I, we'd go to this, go to, we went to one church where they just, they preached the Bible, and we got Bible pumped into our brains, and then we'd go to our church on Sunday night where they were really experiential, and they had this great worship time, and we'd get, we'd, we'd come out of there, and we'd say, man, did you get the Holy Spirit buzz? You guys didn't grow up in the 70s, so you don't know what the Holy Spirit buzz is, huh? All right. But, you know, it's more than just a warm, fuzzy feeling, right? It's more than factual knowledge. It's more than zealous energy. It's more than just a warm feeling. What is it? Here's a, here's a little definition that I've written up here, and you can fill it in. Knowing God is an intimate awareness of God's character and desires which finds its source in the Holy Spirit. Let me say it again. Knowing God is an intimate awareness of God's character and desires, which finds its source in the Holy Spirit. Now, where where do I get that? 
Well, look at, look at, the, look at the verse again. I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. That term, wisdom and revel- spirit of wisdom and revelation. Let's talk about the spirit of revelation. What's he talking about there? The spirit of revelation is when God unveils his character and his desires deep within our heart. When I sat there in Milwaukee County Stadium, God's holiness God's character, God's holiness overwhelmed my heart and I felt dirty, I felt incomplete, I felt confused. And you know what that propelled me towards? It propelled me towards his unconditional love. And I threw myself on Christ's unconditional love. God's character, not only God's character, but his desires. Six months after I gave my life to Christ, I went to a missions conference. And I heard, these, heard this missionary speaking. And that night God unveiled his desires deep within my heart. That night he unveiled the need for missionaries to be sent. This missionary got up and he said these words, and it was over 30 years ago I heard these words and these words still tug at my heart today. And I didn't understand it, I was confused by these words, but I just responded in faith. When this missionary got up and he said, he said, all you Christians here in America, all you do is fight with each other. While hundreds and thousands and millions of people are dying each day without even hearing the name of Jesus. The next day, I went to my friend who was a former missionary and I came to him and I said, Ray, what's a missionary do? I didn't even know what a missionary did. <laughs> and he began to explain to me different things like that and, and I said, well, and he asked me, then he asked me the big question. He said, Gary, why are you asking me this question? And I said, because I think God wants me to be one of those. And he said, well, if God wants you to be one of those, you need to get a good Bible education. I was 20, 22 years old at the time. You need to get a good Bible education. And so my wife and I, we just found a school that had the name Bible in it, and we went to it. <laughs> we ended up at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. Left our jobs, moved down here, and uh, just jumped in. See, it's an intimate awareness of God's character and desires. The spirit of revelation is when God reveals his character and his desires and his purposes deep within your soul. But you know, it's, it's more than that because he says the spirit of wisdom. What's the spirit of wisdom? The spirit of wisdom is when we practically display God's character and desires to a world that's, that needs him so greatly. Yeah, you know, we've got grown children now, but we had two teenage boys. They were close in age, and so they were, they were a handful because they were, you know, had their rebellious spirit like their father did when he was a teenager. And so we used to have this, we used to do holiness training with our sons. And, uh, and so we used to, I used to say this little thing to them all the time. I would say this little mantra that they knew over time, and it was something like this. I, I would say... Uh, Yes, son, remember. And they go, yeah, dad, we know, we know, we know. Sin's like a boomerang. It'll always come back to hit you, okay? And, uh, and so we went through that. But you know what? When I did that holiness training, every time I did that with my sons, I got to know God better because it exposed the holiness training I needed in my heart. There were times in the raising of our children, we had to give them unconditional love. Unconditional love. And every time we had those moments, we had to give our kids unconditional love. You know what? I knew God better because I experienced his unconditional love. See, knowing God better is through what? The experience of God's character and desires and the expressing of God's character and desires. That's how we get to know God better. Paul goes on to his third, third 
thing we can grab onto is how do we become a torchbearer? Is by asking God to give us a bigger picture of who he is. Asking God to give us a bigger picture of who he is. Look what he says. I also pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. What's he talking about there? He's talking about this ever-expanding view of who God is and what God has accomplished deep within our souls. It's an ever-expanding view of who God is and what God has accomplished for us through the gospel. You know, I've met a lot of people and, uh, and I've asked this question to a lot of people over time. What's your picture of God right now? If you were to close your eyes, on the back of your eyelids, what would be your image of God? What would be your picture of God? I remember you know, a woman saying once, she said, someone asked, what's your picture of God? She said, and she was suffering with cancer. And she said, my picture of God is that God has his hands in his pockets and he doesn't want to help me. Now, you know, that was her true experience in the moment. And what she needed was a good Christian friend, a good pastor to come alongside in a compassionate, tender way and say, that's your real experience. But the fact, the truth is, is that God has his hands extended to you. And those hands are scarred because he loved you so much. And he wants to carry you through the pain you're experiencing right now. I remember asking a 16-year-old boy who got in trouble with the law. And I said, what's your picture of God right now? And he said, he's the big boss. And I said, you know, that's true. He is the big boss. <laughs> There's no one higher than him. But you need a fuller picture of who God is. And that fuller picture of who God is is that God is a tender father who is strong and tender and wants to carry you through the mess that you got yourself in if you come to him. What's your picture of God? If you were to close your eyes, what would you see in the back of your eyelids? What's your picture of God? See, Paul's saying, Paul's saying if you want to become a torchbearer, you gotta to have an ever expanding view of who God is and what God has accomplished through his gospel for us. You know what happens to people when they get an ever-expanding view of God? Paul goes on now, and he lists three things. He lists three marks, marks of a person who has an ever-expanding view of God. It's found in, found in the little phrase, if you have your own Bible, you might want to say, in order that, okay? And he's going to list three things. In order that, the first one, that you, that you may know the hope to which he's called you. You see, when a person has an ever-expanding view of God, their life is marked with hope. Not hope so, wish for, but a heavenly confidence that God is for you and not against you. The second thing that happens is that in, in, in the next phrase, the riches of his glorious inheritance in, in the saints. What's he talking about there? You see, when, when a person gets an ever-expanding view of God and they understand the riches of God's spiritual blessings that are found in the gospel, what happens is, is they, 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 they understand their worth. They become, they become a person of immense worth, immense value. Because they're not looking at themselves from the value they bring, they're looking at themselves at the, what the value God brings to their life. You know, if you just look, if you have your Bibles, look at verse th chapter 1, verse 3. He says, praise be to the God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavenly realms with some spiritual blessings. Every spiritual blessing in Christ. And he goes on, and you could, if, if you just take that little word, us, look at the word us there in chapter one, and you can list the spiritual blessings. He's chosen us. He's predestined us. He's adopted us. He's, he's lavished on us all wisdom. He's, 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 he's redeemed us. He's made known to us the mystery of the gospel. He sealed us with his Holy Spirit. These are all spiritual blessings that what that we need to walk in and understand and embrace that what 
tells us that we're worth that, that Christ makes us worthy we find our worth in him and then the third thing is in the little phrase and his incomparably great power for us who believe you see when a person gets an ever-expanding view of God they become a person who understands the power of God in their life and they get deep inner strength they get deep inner strength because they're not resting on willpower they're trusting in the power of Jesus Christ the power of God that was which was what how's he he talks about the, the 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 strength that was exerted in the resurrection the strength exerted in the in the ascension you know God's mighty strength that worked at work in our lives you know how many times I just talk to people who are at quitting points in their life Christ's power can push you through the quitting points in your marriage Christ's power can push you through the quitting points of quitting on your church. Christ's power can, you know, push you through the quitting points and giving up on different relationships. And you know, there's so many seasons as Christians, we operate like powerless Christians, don't we? The Bible says we have the power, that deep inner strength to push us through the quitting points. And we get that by having an ever-expanding view of who God is and what God's accomplished. You know, I've been talking to you as individuals, but this prayer isn't for a group of individuals, it's for a church. It's for a united church, a unified church. And basically, there are three things, three marks of a church. You know, when a church becomes a safe place, when a, church becomes a, 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 when a church becomes a place of hope, it becomes a safe place no matter where people are at in their spiritual journey. So when a church has an ever-expanding view of God, it becomes a safe place because it's a place filled with hope. When a church um, understands its immense worth in God's economy, then it can become a blessing to the world. And I'm so encouraged by the, the stories your pastor is telling about how your church is seeking to be a blessing to your community. You know, that's one of the, one of the keys to evangelism today is, is what, just learning how to bless people in the name of Jesus. And then when a church gets an ever-expanding view of God, it becomes an unstoppable force because it's resting in the power of Jesus, not in willpower. And we've been praying for your church and we know some of the challenges your church has been going through with your building project and financing and all that stuff and we're praying for you and you know what, God, just lean into him. And he's gonna make you an unstoppable force. My uh, sons and I, I've got three children, uh, two boys and a, and a daughter. Uh, our daughter's 21. We're her last year of college, almost done with college payments. Woo-hoo! Yeah! For those who understand that, you can rejoice with me. Uh, but my two boys, when we were growing up, uh, we, we went on a fishing trip. And we take this fishing trip, we, you know, we live in, uh, on the north side of Chicago, and so we basically drive 18 hours with my, my father, my brothers, my brother-in-law, nephews. It's a real guy trip. We just go and we camp along this river up in, up in Canada, and we're standing up there. And, uh, and so when my kids were little, they loved to make torches, right? They would stick a stick in the fire, and they would, you know, get in there, get the tip all red, and they would hold it and go, woo, woo, cool, right? Wow, look at this, Dad, wow. And then, you know, when they got older, they said, Dad, that, that doesn't cut it anymore. We want to build a torch, a real torch. And I said, well, tell me about it. He says, well, you see, Tyler, that's my nephew, he left his sock out, okay? And it got all ruined and everything. And so we're going to take Tyler's sock, we're going to wrap it around this stick, and we're going to take all this twine that you guys have, and we're going to wrap that around, make a big ball, and then we're going to, you know that big vat of cooking oil, Dad? You know you got that big vat of cooking oil you got there to fry the fish in? I go, yeah. He says, then we're going to take it, we're going to dip it in there, Dad. We're going to soak it up real good. And I said, well, number one, you're not going to dip that stinky sock into our cooking oil. 
And so, so they say, oh, what are we going to do? I said, I'll help you out. Because I got excited about this idea. So I said, we'll pour the oil over the sock, right? Soak it up real good. And it was my son Daniel, it was his opportunity, it was his idea, so he got to hold the stick and he, he put the stick in the fire and it's really, really dark out. He put the stick in the fire, all of a sudden, whoosh, this thing's on flames and there's hot oil dripping down. I'm going, oh no, we're, we're, we are literally hours away from the hospital. <laughs> and I can see mom just going, oh. <laughs> That's why we don't tell her about these things, okay? So... We're there, and uh, all of a sudden, he gets this thing, he's got this torch in his hand, and his face was all nervous, and he was afraid and scared, and, and then all of a sudden, this thing turned into one of these perfect torches, just like on Survivor, okay. And he got it, and his face went from joy to glee to excitement, and, and he was holding this torch, and I said, go down, walk down the old dirt road, and let's see how much it illuminates, and so how, how much it lights up, and so he walked down, and I couldn't believe how this little torch was just illuminating this area, which is eating away the darkness, and I said, go out, walk down, go around the trees, and walk out on the point in the river, and I'll walk on, on the bluff here and see if I can see you, and, and so he walked out there, and he, he went out on the end, and, and uh, he yelled out, hey, Dad! can you see me and my nephews I could see them all running around in the light having a great time and and I said I said yes son I can see you and I'm telling you I was just kind of filled with this moment of pride as a father you know we accomplished this thing and right in the midst of that God spoke to me boom and God said Gary that's what the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to look like a light in a world filled with darkness where people can find hope and worth and power. A number of years later, you know how they, in the Olympics, they always had the big torch thing, right? The, the whole torch thing. People run up the stairs and they, and they have that torch and they, they light. There's somebody who's always, you never know who the last person is to light the big, larger torch, right? The big, larger cauldron. And uh, a couple Winter Olympics ago, I think it was in Utah, they had the, 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 the captain of the Miracle on Ice hockey team stood up there. And he, had the, and, he, and he got the torch and he had that person run up. I don't even know who that person was who ran up the stairs, but I was thinking in my mind when that person was running up the stairs, I'm going, what if they had a bucket in their hand? Wouldn't that look really weird? Someone running up those stairs, slopping a bucket of water? trying to do, oh, we're going to do it with the bucket brigade, brigade, you know. But, you know, that's how it looks when we come to church with a bucket in our hand. We just look out of place, right? But no, this person came with a torch, and they came, and they lit his torch. You know what he did? He didn't light the big cauldron all by himself. What he did was that he took and leaned in and lit the larger cauldron with his whole team. You know, that's what the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be like. All of us coming with our individual torches, collectively lighting a larger light of God's life, God's light, and God's love. And you know what? That's what we do together as 190 churches. We come together, work together to start new lighthouses of God's love, to encourage churches whose lights have gone out, and to relight them so that what? We can illuminate the light and the love of Jesus to a world that so desperately needs it. I don't know where you're at today. If you came with a bucket or you came with a torch. But I know all of us need to trim our torches so that they'll be, we'll light them more powerfully in our homes, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods for the glory of Jesus. Let me pray for you right now. Father, we come and we thank you we thank you for the wonders of the cross. We thank you for the wonders of Christ's love. We thank you for the light that God has shown into our hearts. And Father, we come wanting to know you better. Wanting to get a bigger picture of who you are and what you do. And I pray, pray for grace right now. that in a deep and powerful way they'll experience the hope of God 
They'll experience their worth in God's economy. And they'll know and experience the power that is available to us through Jesus Christ. And we ask in his name, amen. Oh, thank you, Gary. <clears throat> yeah, what, what a vivid picture of what we're supposed to be, a, a light. And we've, we actually talked about that in here just uh, a few weeks ago about, you know, we get to be reflectors of God's light, and that really ought to describe us. And so thank you for providing such a visual image of that. Um, you know, some of you may not be familiar with Converge, and, um, and I want to just tell you, uh, if you're a guest in here, we always answer some text questions at the end of the service, and I wasn't planning on doing a text question. I'm going to answer this one, but okay. there's one text question that came in before you started speaking, and, uh, and I think you answered it beautifully. Um, but I wanted to read this to you. Uh, this is a text question that came in. You know, why, why, in light of the fact that financially speaking, you know, we've had some, some tough hurdles to overcome, and so someone asked, you know, very valid question, uh, why are we sending Converge a monthly check if we ourselves are short in our own budget? Is Grace trying to become a mega church? And so I just want to answer this because I really, you just provided such a visual at the very end. Um, you know, yes, we, we have some hurdles when it comes to the finances of this church. Uh, we are not interested in becoming a mega church. That's not our goal. Our, our goal is to be torchbearers. And you just talked about these collective efforts of these churches coming together to make a difference in the world. Uh, that's what we want to do. As a church, we have made a commitment to say, how do we actually become this life-changing community? that God's called us to. And we feel like uh, there's multiple ways we do it. Part of it is by building some great opportunities to grow here and to carry the torch within this box. But you know that we've made a commitment to actually make a difference outside the walls of this church. And so we've, we do that in many different ways. But one of those ways is we team up with places and people like you. And we know that you are... Uh, you have a unique platform to be able to uh, make a difference through many different churches. And so whenever you give money, uh, I want you to know that uh, what we did at the beginning of this year is we said we were going to take a percentage of the money that comes in and we were going to give it away. We, we were going to take part of it and build the ministries of this church, but then we're going to take another part of it and actually give it away because we felt like this would be a way that we could make a difference in the world. And I wish you could sit down with Gary and just hear the countless stories of what God's doing through the churches that are part of Converge. It's just amazing. And we get to be a part of that. Whenever you hear those stories, you're a part of that because you are giving through Grace Church to be a part of, of and, Converge. And, we're, and you know, we, we are a regional missional arm of your church. Uh, we're not, we don't oversee your church. We're not over your church. I work for the churches. You know, I, I come into some churches and the pastor says, this is my boss. I'm not, you know, I, I work for you guys. I work for your church. Our mission exists because of the will of the churches. And uh, we've had a long, long partnership with this church, uh, way beyond me, way beyond Pastor Jason and, uh, and your, your, your partnership is uh, so vital to, to what we do here. Yeah. And, it's, and it's great. And I think we're going to continue to hear countless stories. Um, if someone wanted to find out more about how to keep up with what's going on through Converge yeah. or keep up with you, how yep. would they do that? Yep, you can go to our, go to our website, you know, uh, convergementamerica.org. Pretty easy to get to. You can get us, follow us on Facebook. I'd love to have 500 new f likes on our <laughs> Facebook page, okay? Yep. <laughs> And uh, you can follow us with all sorts of stuff going on there, baptism stories. You know, we, 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 we are reaching about nine different ethnic groups right here in the, right here in the mid, mid America region. And actually, we're mo I'm going in a few, a few weeks, going to Monmouth, Illinois, work with a church that's 100 years old. Well, they have a whole a Burmese uh, group of people there who are now meeting in their, meeting in their building, 90 Burmese people. I don't even know the language they speak. But, uh, but, I mean, they're reaching this, this, this community the, of the, this wave of immigrants that have come in. Uh, and so we've got several churches like that. Um, and, you know, so we're, 46% of our churches are either multi, uh, multicultural or multi-ethnic. And so we have a rich diversity uh, in our group and, uh, and God's reaching. And so and actually we have a missionary coming back. Uh, and he is, you know, the largest population of Arabic and, and Arabic people and Muslim people is in Detroit. 
And, uh, and we've got a missionary coming off the mission field from Lebanon, and he's going to help plant an Arabic-speaking church uh, in Deerfield. And so, um, that's a, anyway. That's a prime example of why you're, you're able to help some churches do some things that we couldn't do. Like, we, that would not, we couldn't make that kind of impact to that type of culture here. So we get to be a part of something much bigger, um, and so we're, we're thrilled to get to be a part of that. Yep. I wanted to brag on you just a, just a moment. <laughs> this is um, on the back of the handout. We always put on there where our financials are, and if you look on there, our giving this past uh, Sunday was, was $20,498. Uh, that, yeah, clock. that's, you know. Uh, just a few months back, you know that we, we kind of reduced our budget need to 13611 which means we far exceeded what our weekly need is, uh, which is incredible. We want to be a church that has budgeted in a way that we are being good stewards of what God has given us responsibility over. I do want to call your attention to the fact that we are still uh, $100,000 in the hole, okay? So we are still trying to make up for some things, but that is just to be commended because not only is that allowing us to do some great things right here inside this box, uh, but it also means that we are getting to be a part of stories like you just heard, where we're getting to make an impact uh, around the world. And so you should be commended for that. We are thankful that God has given us the, bil- the ability to do it. And so celebrate that. Yeah, can I just say one affirming thing? Is I, I try, every week I'm in a different church. I mean, you know, my... My daughter's Sunday school class didn't think her dad was a Christian because I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> he never goes to church. And about, never. and uh, you know, single guys are hitting on my wife every Sunday. So anyway, but. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, but here, here's. It, oh, Sorry. That? Wow. wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's anyway. My anyway, stay right so there. I had to preach. I had to, I had to preach at my home church. And I had to say, you know, yes, Callie's dad is a Christian, and Mary, my wife, is not single. So. <laughs> Leave her alone. Wow. Anyway, but I go around, you know, here's the churches that are sort of thriving during these economic challenges. We're in the Great Recession, the second greatest financial crisis our country's ever experienced. And the churches that are thriving, that are finding God's provision, are the churches that are what? They're committing to tithing and committing to giving outside themselves. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I always say generosity starts with tithing. Generosity starts with tithing. And so the courage of your leadership team, the courage of your pastoral staff, God is gonna honor that and he's gonna provide everything you need as you move forward. Thanks, Gary. Well, well, Gary's gonna stand right down here at the service. If you would like to talk with him, ask him some questions, hear a story or two, uh, you can come meet with him. There's quite a bit going on after the service. So I wanna just tell you some final instructions and then we're gonna close by praying. We're gonna pray for the churches represented by what you do. We're gonna pray for the ministries that are happening through Grace Church and then you're gonna be dismissed after that. But um, just wanna say a couple of things. So he'll be standing over here. I also wanna remind you that Sweet and Greet is uh, first Sunday of each month. So you'll notice some really great food over there. We want you to, to grab some food, talk to somebody you may not know. That's just an opportunity to fellowship over a table. And uh, so we want you to be a part of that. Um, but then we do need to quickly kind of move out um, because we do have focus classes that are happening. Focus classes are every Sunday after the service. We have a four-week cycle of some topic that we want to focus in on to help you grow in your spiritual walk, to have a biblical perspective. And so I want to tell you about what these are today. You don't have to register or pre-register for it. You can just show up. Um, so uh, this class in the corner back here is on marriage and so if you want to know how to have the marriage you've always wanted this is the last week of that class but you can go in there and you can find out more about that and this back corner this is discover grace this is if you want to know some of the distinctives about our church uh, you go to that class today it's gonna be on baptism this next Sunday we're gonna have a great baptism service and if you've been thinking maybe I should get baptized uh, check that out it's just for one hour or a little bit less and we can help you understand a little bit more about what it means what we what we understand so there we go. What well, we, we understand baptism to be. So uh, you can go to that. And then finally, there's a class right up here in the front. Uh, we, we have had the privilege of having an elder or a staff member just uh, share with us some core conversation. That's what we call it, core conversations. It gives you an opportunity to hear what's on the heart of our staff and elders. And so Mark Buholz is going to be right up here in the front. Uh, he's right here in this little section. They'll pull a wall around, and that's going to be a classroom. And uh, he's going to be sharing with us. I want to make sure I get it right. Uh, how we can, are able to see our own spheres of influence and connect those opportunities with what the Lord is already doing in our own lives, basically being a torchbearer. So he's going to give us some practical uh, parameters and perspective on that. Uh, You can be a part of that. 
There's things going on for our middle schoolers in the other building and for our children, so uh, you can uh, definitely participate. We want to get circled up so that we can grow together. Uh, so next week, just let me give you the final plug for this. Uh, when you come in here, our focus classes next week that we'll start is Catholic Roots. So if you have a Catholic background and you're trying to make sense of what this is all about, we're going to spend four weeks on um, working through that. You may not even have a Catholic background, but you're trying to understand so you can talk to your friends, your neighbors. So this is a great class to get a perspective on that. You have a Catholic background, right? So, yep. And then finding financial peace. Uh, if you have been trying to make sense of your finances, we're going to have one that's called finding financial peace and then one that's called single again. And this is basically, uh, you may not even be single again, but let's say you have a friend that's kind of going through a divorce or maybe you have some friends that you're trying to understand what's going on in their world. This is a great class to give perspective on what it means, uh, what, what's all involved and how to have a biblical perspective when you find yourself single again. So those are th some great things going on. I know that's a lot of announcements here at the end. Uh, I want to pray and then at the end of the service, uh, again, uh, connection point there to get information, some food over here. Gary's going to be standing here and the classes will be there. Um, we'll have a great time continuing to grow together. So let's pray. God, I thank you uh, that you have allowed us to experience uh, your truth uh, through your word today. I thank you, God, that you have uh, allowed us to be a part of something much bigger than ourselves. God, I thank you that you have not put us on the task of building the kingdom of Grace Bible Church, but instead you have allowed us to be a part of making a difference, uh, being a life-changing community uh, here, but also around the world. And so, God, thank you for giving us partnerships. Thank you for giving us relationships with others in such a way that we can be a part of something so big. God, I pray that you will continue to meet the needs financially of this church, but also, God, that you would allow us to help meet the financial needs of other churches that are doing great eternal things for your namesake. I pray for Gary as he drives back. I pray that you'll watch over him, get him back to his family safely. Uh, and I pray, God, that you will just allow us to do uh, more for your namesake. So God, thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.